Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Amen. Amen. When you study the book of Revelation, you get entangled, as I do, I'm sure, with all the beasts. Well, today is about the land beasts. Yesterday, or last Sabbath, was about the sea creatures and the birds of the air, day five. Today we, we take into consideration the fact that God waits he waits until the sixth day, until the last day that he is doing his creation. He has done everything that is necessary now to put bigger animals and little animals and slithering animals and creeping animals. The Bible even uses that word, those that creep along the ground. Some of you have creatures like this like I do around my house. How many of you enjoy seeing as, as you approach your house, maybe you come up to your door or maybe you come out of your back door and you've got some bushes around and there's a lizard that just goes Shh. Or maybe he doesn't even move anymore when you come by because he knows that you are not going to harm him. Um, there, are some, there, there are quite a lot of lizards around and, and they they are fun. You see them sitting in the sunshine because they are cold-blooded creatures and they, they sit in the sunshine to get warm and then maybe you'll see two of them trying to do battle and they're up on their, their front legs and they're going kind of like this and like, hey dude, look, this is my territory. You know, this trash can over here, I hide underneath there. You can't hide under that trash can. It's mine. That's what they're saying, right? That's my lizard. He lives under my trash can. That's where he hides every time I come by, but then he'll come back out and he'll be uh, there in the sunshine. God, God has this, let's just face it, God has this weird imagination. Have you ever thought about that? But yet, he has a certain symmetry to the way that he has made things. Uh, I, I kind of think about this when I think of the flood. Certain animals make it onto the ark and certain ones do not. Have you ever wondered why certain ones didn't make it on? Well, uh, how many vertebrae, you know vertebrae, back, bones, how many vertebrae does a giraffe have? How many vertebrae do you have? Cervical vertebrae? Seven cervical vertebrae. Twelve thoracic and five lumbar. So total, does a giraffe have the same or different? Not a, he's not a giraffe. He hasn't asked a, a, a local giraffe. E, even, though, even though if we were to say we had a giraffe with us, it would be you, Milt, being that you are uh, tall like a giraffe. Uh, they have the same number of cervical vertebrae as we have. Now, I don't know if this was all in, well, it had to all be in God's head at the same time when he creates all of the land animals on the sixth day, the, the evening and the morning. So fifth day finishes, he says it's all good, and the sixth day begins, and 
as the sun comes up on the sixth day, out of God's imagination come all of these creatures that we love to look at on TV mostly. Some of us are more interested in being close and so we might actually go to the zoo and get close. Some of us actually dare to have animals live in our house. How many of you have a cat? You have an animal with four legs and fur living in your what? You have an animal in your house? What about a dog? How many? You have a canine living in your house. When I was young, I saw police cars, and they had canine on the side. I thought that canines were only German shepherds. That, is, that was a canine, because all I saw coming out of a police car with uh, that, that said canine on the side was a German shepherd. So my mom had to tell me, no, canine is short for the name for all dogs. And God makes, God makes these animals. Maybe, maybe he just made the wolf. We think that wolves are the first dog and that every other dog has come from wolves. But do you really think that he only made wolves? I've got a feeling that there were some domestic dogs as well. Just ask the people who go to Madison Square Garden and watch the dog show. I mean, it's a life, let me tell you. If you're into dogs, you have air conditioning, you have beauty salons. You know, down the street from me, you can go to You Doggy Wash. You, you wash doggy. You wash dog, yes, and, and, and just the other day, I took my mom's dog for her summer cut. You have to take care. You have to take care of these domestic animals because that is what God created us to do. So you have, on the sixth day, you have land animals, and then the crowning piece, as we have always said, is the human the human animal. God gets down. I think this is important for us to remember. It bears saying again. He gets down in the dirt. We say ashes to ashes. Um, that's probably more appropriate in India where they do cremation mostly. But let me tell you, we are made of dirt. When we uh, listen to the music by a group called jars of clay we also invoke a biblical theme where the potter gets the clay and he forms it into exactly what he wants we are that clay we are that dirt and he does a special thing he forms a human in this case Adam or blood you, did, you, you thought that the, the, the gangs had a, a special thing when they called themselves the Bloods? Well, that is special because it has to do with the first humans. The first human was called Adam. Dam is the word in Hebrew for blood. He forms him in his entirety, in his intricacy, and then he breathes into him. God kisses Adam and gives him the breath of life. And the Bible says he becomes a living soul. This thinking that we do every day, this, this interaction with each other, God created us to be that way. Now, there have been years, millennia, that have gotten in the way and we have degenerated, that is for sure. We are not as strong as our ancestors. Sin and pollution has taken its course. With us, we are not like God created us. 
Nonetheless, though, at creation, he gives Adam his own mate. So ladies, don't let's think that just because it's Father's Day, we are forgetting you because out of his own side, made with his own flesh and bone, God creates Eve. God creates a mate for Adam because he's out and about on this day of creation looking at all the animals doing what God has asked him to do which is to inspect the world into which he has been made and to give names for all the animals be it known unto you that this naming process is actually the execution of his job description. Adam was to have dominion over the animals. The naming process is your choice as the person in charge. You get to be the one who gives the name. When fathers and mothers have kids together, they usually get together and they uh, agree on a name. But there's a family name that most often comes from the father. It doesn't have to. And uh, Inga and Birker aren't with us today, but how many of you know that Inga's last name is different from Birker's? Okay. And what is the last part of Inga's name? Last name. D-O-T-T-I-R. That's Icelandic for daughter. So if you had to see a moving van in Iceland, it would be somebody, 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 and daughters. They're very egalitarian in Scandinavian countries and, and, and Iceland in particular. And so girls take on their father's name with, instead of Mike Stevenson, if I had a daughter, she would be son of or daughter of Stephen's daughter. It's a nice, it's a nice tradition. I, I, I do like it. I think it, it helps the world to know that there are girls and boys, especially girls, who are connected to their dads. And I just want to give a shout out to my daughter and say I'm proud of you. God gives Adam dominion. He gets to live in a garden. God puts order and creativity and beauty and he gives us the job of being wonderful. Have you ever thought of that word? Have you ever thought that maybe you do not spend or maybe I'm just going to let us all off. Maybe we don't have enough time to wonder at the creation of God. Today would be a good day. Look, the marine layer has been burnt off. We have sunshine. Isn't that great? Today you have the opportunity to go out into nature to see creatures and to see the, 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 the seed-bearing plants and to wonder at the God who has made them. This is, this is the attitude that God wants us to have. Curiosity, I believe, gives birth to discovery. Discovery gives birth to knowledge, and knowledge gives birth to wisdom. And all of this comes from God because he created us to be curious, to want to discover, to want to have knowledge, and then he gives us the wisdom to know how to use all of that. It's why I want to live forever. Because I'm telling you, if you're not curious, then you probably don't want to live forever. I want to live forever because God has promised that it will never get boring. He will continue letting us expand our knowledge and discover all kinds of things about his universe. And this is the continuation of what he created us to be. Wisdom, knowledge, discovery. God made the world infinitely, as in without end, infinitely interesting. I would hazard a saying to you today that if you are not interested, 
it's kind of a slap in God's face. If it doesn't interest you, you might want to check on your relationship with, with the Creator God. Because He created it for you to enjoy. We, we still don't know everything about our planet home, even 2,000 years after Jesus the Christ came to this earth. So that's why I think we need eternity. We need eternity to gather more and more and more and more knowledge of which there will be no end. So our Heavenly Father creates land animals and then also his human children on this, the sixth day. By the way, quick parenthesis, those of you who love prophecy study, since we are dealing with day six and man and woman, why do you think there is a number in the Bible, 666? This is the bonus for today, by the way. You can forget everything else, but you'll probably go home thinking, I learned what 666 means. Well, it's because man is created on the sixth day it is his number. So when you meet it in Revelation and you've, you, 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 you hear that it is the number of the beast, understand that it is man taking God's place. How many? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you have three what I'm calling, you can, you can steal this if you like, the, the man trinity. The man trinity. God in God's place being taken by humanity, putting themselves in his place. Now lest we point anywhere else, please remember that there are always three fingers pointing back at us let us not be part of the evil empire that basically is different from God's empire in this one aspect that it puts something else, anything else, in God's place. But when man puts himself in God's place, it comes up pretty beastly. That's the end of the parenthesis. God creates his human children in his own image. The Latin for that is imago Dei. Some of you have heard this phrase, the image of God. It's the study that PhD students have done over the years. It's a huge topic. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? God is this, this community Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's not just one. It's also three in one. And so he, he has to create his human family in this community. So Adam loses a rib and it becomes his wife. And that is why we still say at every wedding that the two become one. And then through the beauty and power of procreation, mom and dad and baby makes three. And so you have a family. You have a family just like the Trinity. Eric loves to remind us that God created them in his image. So ladies... Do not absent yourself from this situation. He created them in his image. And the image that he created them in is of the creator. So when we produce children, dads, moms, when we produce children together, that to me is the zenith. It is the, it is the thing that, that we do as humans that makes us the most like God. 
together with his power, with the spark of life that he gives in that moment of connection between the mom part and the dad part that comes together in the womb of the mother. The spark of life that God gives in cooperation. Cooperation. God creates us in community. Father, mother, child. And so family was born. Well, the first commandment that God gives to his, his human family, he gives this to to Adam and then also to Eve. The first commandment is to be fruitful and multiply. Can you imagine? We, we look at, at the, the great apes, for example, and we love to study them and, and, and we love to, to honor people who have spent their entire lives in forests getting close to silverback gorillas. I'd love to, except to be a little scary too, to a certain extent. Those guys are really strong. I mean, super strong. But they spend their days eating, sleeping, and procreating. Now, why do you think that we would need to do any different? I would challenge you to study the economy that God set in place for his people in, the, in Canaan when he brought them back from Egypt and realize that every seventh year, what were they supposed to do? No, every seventh year. Every 50th year was a jubilee. That's, four, that's seven sevens of 49 plus one. But every seventh year, what was supposed to happen? Come on, you're Sabbath keepers, you should know. Let the land rest, and God said, I'll provide the smorgasbord. I'll feed you for the entire year. You don't have to work for it. talking with Mrs. Miller this week and we mentioned the fact that we should be remembering this particular aspect when we come to church on Sabbath that it's not a, just about church it's about the fact that God says every week to us every seven days that's why seven is this important number every seven days he's saying to us I've got you I provide for you you don't have to worry about providing for yourself both in this life and in the next. I will give you the energy. I will give you the brain power. I will give you whatever you need in order to provide for yourself. That's why I think he laughs when he writes the fourth commandment. Oh, go ahead. I'll give you six days. Just work, work yourself to death. That, that's okay. But on the seventh day, just, you got to put that stuff down. Stop trying to take care of yourself. Stop trying to save yourself. I've got you. And can you imagine a whole year? I mean, this is what we call, even in industry today, we call this a sabbatical, right? A time when you take time off and someone else supports you while you can do and you can create and you can do the unusual. We call this a sabbatical. God said, I'll give you an economy where you take a whole day off every week and you take every seventh year off and then in the 50th year, what I want you to do is let everything reset to the beginning. So if you acquired some land from someone else, it goes back to that person. God creates the land beasts. He creates Adam and Eve. And on the seventh, on, on, the, on that day, he creates them to be in his image as the creator God. And then he gives them the earth to take care of. This is the job description. Be fruitful and multiply and take care of the earth. Now, 
This is something that I believe we are waking up to as a Seventh-day Adventist church. There is a new uh, uh, part of theology called echo, echo theology. And in fact, a, a fellow right here at uh, Loma Linda, uh, Richard, help me, uh, he's a Norwegian, T Tonstad. Last name Tonstad. Dr. Tonstad has written a nice big thick book on the Sabbath and how it points to us having a theology of ecology. That this God who creates us in creation week and then gives us a job description to take care of the earth. I can't let this go. I must tell you that I believe that we as seventh day people need to be taking a more clear stance on taking care of the earth. Now, I'm believing that that will take many different forms. I'm believing that our young people probably will be able to lead us into righteousness on this, in, in this case. Because there are younger folk who are much more interested in what's happening with our oceans and the pollution that we are putting in them. Many, many younger people are much more interested in what is happening with the water and, and, and making sure that, that humanity in general, not just in North America, but that humanity in general has access to fresh water. When you live in Israel, you understand this a lot better than we do today. We have the Sierras giving us water, but what if you only had one mountain called Mount Hermon? And the snows from Mount Hermon come down and form the beginning of the Jordan River, and that's the only major river in your country. And it flows into, the, into Lake Galilee, and then it flows out of Lake Galilee down to the Dead Sea. Just like the Colorado River never reaches the sea anymore, hardly any water from the Jordan River is reaching the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea is shrinking. At 1,500 feet below sea level, the Dead Sea is full of minerals that the Israelis mine, and, and, and they do all kinds of fabulous stuff with that, but the Dead Sea is shrinking because more and more agriculture is using up the little bit of resources. So do you know who is at the front end of, of salt water desalination technology? Because they know that they're going to need it very shortly? The Israelis turning seawater into drinking water and water that they can use on their fields because they know that very shortly they will not have enough water. It's the way that the world is right now. God said, take care, take care of the earth. Yes, I pick up trash. And I'm inviting you all to do the same. Don't throw it away. Pick it up. I go into my uh, club here at, at, at LA Fitness and the, I see wrappers and I see papers and, and, and sometimes discarded pieces of clothing. I have made it my job to say, this is my club. I'm going to pick up that paper. Yes, I go to the little dispenser of hand cleaner afterwards. Yes. I know it's got germs on it, but I, you know what I tell myself? I can always wash my hands. But I'm going to pick up that trash because if we picked up our trash, there wouldn't be as much problem in the world. It's a small thing, but it makes a big impact. So I'm going to invite you to join me in this. When you go for a walk in nature, if you see some trash, pick it up. It's becoming a global effort, started in Scandinavia where people would go for runs, and now these people are stopping and picking up things that should not be there when they're out in nature. So rather than destroying nature, they are caring for nature. Again, it's a small thing. But if you decide that when you see something, you're going to do something about it, that small thing changes what happens next and then it becomes a habit 
to do these kinds of things and the, the world is a better place. I say that we've been told to take care of the earth. I've, I, I see live well. I think it's on the back of Inga's car. Hashtag live well. I think that's what God was trying to tell us when he said take care of the earth. Be kind. Have you seen that bumper sticker? Be kind. It, it would probably do us all good to, to take that to heart. Be kind, not only to uh, another human, but also to the earth. Be kind, considerate, take care of the creation that God made in six days. Philip, the disciple of Jesus, asks a question one day, and I think it's, it was a little shocking to Jesus, but as he usually was, he was very kind in the way that he answered Philip. Philip asked him, show us the Father. If you say that you are the Son and you have a Father, show us the Father. And Jesus says to him, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Maybe he could have used a colloquialism that we have used in the past. Oh, he was a chip off the old block. Back in the days when you had to chop up firewood, you know, with a big, uh, okay, you know what I mean. We don't say that much anymore. Or uh, he, was, he was the spitting image of his father. People thought that I looked like my father, they definitely thought that I sounded like my father, so much so that when I was young, the phone would ring in England, particularly after my voice had changed, and I would go and answer the phone, and on the other end, I would hear the voice of one of my father's associates. And I would, I would answer uh, in my best voice, and suddenly they would take off talking to me as if they thought it was my dad. And then I would have to pull myself out of the conversation and go and get my dad and put him on the phone. I thought it was funny. I'm not sure that they did, but anyway. <laughs> I was my dad for a moment. I was my dad. If you've seen me, Jesus says, you've seen the Father. I've said it to you and I'm going to say it again. Jesus is that communication device that God has chosen to use to express himself to us. So whatever it is that you have in your mind about this father-son relationship, just understand that God did it deliberately and that, that he, I don't know why he didn't choose a mother-daughter relationship, but he chooses a father-son relationship and he says, this is how it is between me and my father. I don't do anything. I don't say anything unless he tells me to do it or say it. That's how it is between me and my father. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. I and the father are one, Jesus says. Jesus is the incarnate father. So if you're wondering what kind of father to be, if you are a father or you wish someday to be a father and you want to know what kind of father should you be, I would commend to you Jesus. Jesus comes along and he says to the disciple who asks him, please show us the ultimate father. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So what is left to us today? I believe it is to be a witness. Both fathers, mothers, all of us. It is to be a witness to what God has done for us, to what God has done to us, what he has, has been able to accomplish with our permission to our minds, and our bodies, that we have survived, 
Yes, my friends, that is what we are looking at when we think of Peter today, who is the father of Jordan and Luke. We're thinking that his survival might not be as long as ours. But yeah, I'm getting to that place in my life where when I celebrate a birthday, I'm going, yeah, I made it. You know what? Because others haven't. 94, 2. Yeah, that's why we honor Virginia and 90, right, Lorraine? How old? 95? 96. 96. Oh, forgive me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So she knew what was happening in the last century. Not just the last millennium, but the last century, too. Hallelujah, you made it. Another revolution, bless Eric, another revolution of the sun. But yet, but yet, how quickly, how quickly. Garland, you, you were, you were as, as young and good looking as, as that other guy right here. What was that? Two blinks of an eye ago, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. You're still good looking, by the way. It goes, kids, let me just tell you, it goes by too fast. Take it from an old guy. Did I actually say that? I don't want to admit that. Come on. I look at Milton there and I say, uh, oh no, no, he and I are not that far apart. I can't do, it. anyway. You know what? What is left to us is to witness to what God has done in us and for us. The change that he is making uh, in the us that has given him permission to, to take us away from the rebellion that is in this world today. The us that, that our fathers. I say what is left to us is to be representers, to be to be the ones who, who present a picture of God that when somebody says, show us the Father, that we can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because you know what? My brother is Jesus. And I'm being like him. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I want to also be able to say, if you've seen me, you've seen my Heavenly Father because we're family. And he's my Father and he can be your Father. I think what's left to us today is to be representers. So are you going to have the joy of repping for your Heavenly Father? Ladies, I'm not going to let you off either because you get to, you came out of the rib, you are equal in the sight of God, male and female, created he them. So we, we, the us that is here today, we can be representers of our heavenly father. So today is Father's Day. I say, let us worship, let us worship the Father the creator God who made humanity. Let us honor him by taking care of the earth and taking care of our families. Amen.